Hi, welcome back. So we're going to talk today about opioid partial agonists. And you guys have reviewed partial agonists for your prerequisite materials, but I think that it's important enough to go over one more time in the context of opioids. Here we're going to look at a dose response curve. And so not dose binding, but our response here is our percent efficacy and our dose here is our log dose. And so as you increase your dose, you're increasing your response, just like we expected. Now you guys remember that a full agonist, in this case we're using methadone as an example, when it binds, every receptor it binds, it activates. So if you have 100% of receptors bound, then you get 100% of them activated. An antagonist, on the other hand, when it binds receptors, but it never activates them. So if 100% of an antagonist binds a receptor, none of them are activated. Partial agonists are somewhere in the middle. So you can have partial agonists that are very strong activators and partial agonists that are very weak activators. Really, that just has to do with what percentage of the time that they're bound are they actually activating. So if I took something that's about an 80% of the time it's active, then I might have a very high efficacy partial agonist. This one is a moderate efficacy partial agonist. And if you had one down here where it was mostly off and only rarely on, so say 15% of the time the receptor was turned on and 85% of the time it was off, then you'd have a very low efficacy. If most of the time when it binds, it's going to activate it because you have a high efficacy partial agonist, then usually it's going to be acting like an agonist, not like an antagonist. And if it's extremely low efficacy, then usually it'll act more like an antagonist. If it's this very low efficacy, then if it's given without any other agonist around, you're just going to get a low efficacy effect. So you're not going to be able to get a lot of effect. Opioids are a drug class that have really varied efficacies. And so we don't actually have a point where we say at X percent now we're high efficacy and at Y percent now we're low. So we don't really standardize them that way. So really, they basically call all the really high efficacy ones full agonists, even if they're not 100%. And they basically call all of the really low efficacy ones antagonists, even though they may have a little tiny bit of efficacy. And then you've got the ones that we really recognize are in the middle and that their effects are really going to depend on whether there's a full agonist present or whether there's not. And we'll talk about that again more. So the two drug classes I want to really distinguish between here are the partial agonist, mu partial agonist. And so again, every time we say partial agonist, I want you to remember it's a partial agonist, partial antag. It's really just how you're going to look at it, what situation it's in, whether you're going to see an agonist-like or antagonist-like end effect. So we've got these mu partial agonists, and the most common one is buprenorphine or buprenex. And that one's really easy to remember that that's partial because of the PR for partial. I don't want you guys to confuse that with other opioids or even something like butorphanol that a lot of people confuse with it because the PR is what's telling you partial. Tramadol or Ultram is one of the other mu partial agonists and so is Tependadol. And you don't need to know Tependadol and you don't need to know the actual names of this next drug class, but I do want you to have heard them. So the drug class that we're separating partial agonists from are called the mixed agonist antagonists. And what that really means is they are agonists at kappa receptors and they're antagonists at mu receptors. So with the mu partial, you've got partial mu agonism and you do have a little bit of antagonism at kappas, but not a lot. 
And then with these mixed agonist antagonists, you've got strong agonism at the kappa and just a little tiny bit of partial agonist activity at the mu. So we're calling it the antagonist, but that's because it has really low efficacy. So I'm gonna say very low mu efficacy. So I want you to kind of keep these very, very separate in your mind, that they're two completely different drug classes. So let's remember what happens with a partial agonist. Here's the dose again, here's, in this case, analgesic activity. With a full agonist, you increase the dose, keep increasing the dose, and you increase the response, until you reach a point where all the receptors are occupied. And then that was our Emax. With the partial agonist, you did the same. You increased the dose, you got an increasing response, but then you level out with a much lower effect because they're not activating all of the receptors they're bound to. Technically, with the full agonist opioids, you can keep getting increased analgesia as you increase your dose all the way up until you reach the point that the opioid actually causes respiratory depression and death. So you never actually reach a point where you can't get more analgesia. So we say that there's no ceiling on the analgesia because you can always get more until the patient stops breathing. The partial agonist opioids like buprenorphine have their maximum effect below the respiratory depression so you can increase the dose and the effect of the opioid is going to level off here at its lower Emax. And it's never going to have enough activation of mu receptors to ever reach respiratory depression. So this is a really important thing about buprenorphine because it has what they call a ceiling effect, analgesic ceiling which is that phenomenon where you reach a point where you're not increasing your effect. You're not increasing your analgesia. So you could be giving the patient this dose. It's not working, so you decide just to give them more. It's not going to do anything more. So that is a limitation for partial agonists in that you can't get as strong an analgesia from them. However, that same ceiling effect means that you're not going to overdose someone because it's not going to be strong enough to produce respiratory depression on its own. One thing to note about that is I am saying on their own, and that's because while buprenorphine or mu opioid partial agonists don't have enough effect to cause respiratory depression given themselves, they can contribute to respiratory depression when given with other drugs that also do that. So mixed with a barbiturate and alcohol and a partial agonist opioid, they can all just be contributing until it reaches the point where someone can die of an overdose. But in and of itself, the partial agonist buprenorphine wouldn't do that. A good example of the respiratory depression ceiling is here in this paper. They're looking at two drugs, fentanyl, which is a full agonist, and buprenorphine, which was your partial. And so we're gonna specify mu, and here's your dose, and here's your response. But in this case, response is respiratory rate or ventilation. So here is where you wanna start out. Here's a full healthy respiration rate, and then as you take more of the drug, you get a decrease in respiration. And see with the fentanyl, as you increase the drug, it just continues to decrease until you reach the point where, unfortunately here, your respiration ends. And in fact, it is really easy to overdose on fentanyl and stop breathing. If you look over here though at the buprenorphine, you start out at the same respiratory rate, and as you would expect, as you give more of a dose, you get an effect, so your respiratory rate comes down, but now you hit that area where you have that lessened efficacy, and you no longer have any more effect on respiration. So you can see that that actually is a big difference, and yes, you are decreasing respiratory rate, and that isn't a good thing, but in terms of actually overdosing and dying because of respiratory depression, that does not seem to be a big issue with buprenorphine. 
And it is that partial agonism activity that explains that. So we should think about, would a partial agonist like buprenorphine, mu partial agonist, would that cause withdrawal symptoms if given to someone who is dependent on and currently taking mu opioids? So we'll say this person is dependent on mu opioids. So if you take away the mu opioids, instead of tapering them down slowly, if you just take that opioid effect away acutely, then they will go into withdrawal, right? Because they're dependent. So we know that if you completely take away the mu opioid effect, they'll go into withdrawal. Right now, I'm telling you they're taking mu opioids, so they have that in their system. So they have the mu full agonist in their system. So if you give them this partial agonist, it's going to interact And when we just say taking mu opioids, we're really assuming that that means they're a full agonist. Because partial agonists, there's only a couple of them, and when we talk about them, we're really specifying this is a partial agonist we're talking about. So anytime you see anybody saying taking a mu opioid, you're assuming it's one of those full agonists. So what happens if you take a partial agonist and you don't have any full agonist on board? So if you don't have any agonist already there, then there's nothing activating these receptors, these mu receptors. So if you add a partial agonist, then if it binds all of them, it's only going to activate a few, but they're still being activated. So if you had no full agonist on board, then adding a partial agonist will have an agonist effect. So someone that comes in that wasn't currently taking mu opioids, if you added the partial agonist, they would have an analgesic effect because they're adding opioid activity. On the other hand, this question was asking about someone who's currently taking mu opioids. And that by that you're assuming that they have those opioids in their system right now. So we've got those receptors, and now we're saying that that person is already taking an opioid. And that opioid, full opioid, is activating all the receptors that it's bound to. So it's fully active. The mu response is fully activated. Now when you take the partial agonist, maybe it kicks off a couple of these and binds instead. Now, not all of those partial agonists bound are going to activate the receptor. So you've still got some of the receptors activated from the full agonist, but only a couple of the partial agonist receptors are going to be activated. So now you went from full activation, added a partial, and now you have less activation. So in the presence of a full agonist with full, then a partial agonist is going to have an antagonist effect. So when you look at the question then, would a partial agonist cause acute withdrawal symptoms? Well, assuming that you have someone who is currently taking mu opioids, knowing that those are going to be full agonists, if you gave them a partial agonist, you'd knock some of that full agonist off, you'd replace it with a weaker opioid, and now their opioid response would drop. If they're dependent, then you know that they're going to go into withdrawal if they lose their opioid response because we're using the, the appropriate terminology here and dependent is always going to mean physically dependent, not addicted. They may be addicted, we don't know, but that's not what dependent means. So this partial agonist if I gave it to someone who wasn't on a mu opioid, it would activate them, they'd have opioid effects. 
I give it to this person who is currently taking me opioids, reduces the opioid receptor activation. Because they're dependent on it, now they go into withdrawals. So if we're looking at withdrawal being caused by anything that is dropping the amount of activation of the mu receptor in someone who's physically dependent, then we have a lot of different drugs, a lot of different opioid family agents that can drop mu agonism activity, drop or decrease mu receptor activity. A mu antagonist, that's pretty obvious. If you take a mu antagonist, you're going to block all the receptor activity at the mu receptors. So we've got naloxone, naltrexone. If you have a mixed kappa agonist mu antagonist, yes, these are very low efficacy partial agonist, but they're so low efficacy that we are going to consider that really the only effect they're going to have is antagonism. So if you take a mixed kappa agonist mu antagonist, you're going to block mu opioid activity. And if someone is physically dependent on the mu opioid, then that's going to put them into withdrawals. Say they're not physically dependent on it, but they're in the hospital and they're given morphine, which is a full mu agonist, and that's helping their pain. But then someone else comes in and gives them buprenorphine. So that's going to decrease the effect of the morphine, and now they'd have less pain relief. So that interaction between the full and partial agonist is always going to be there. You can have it in someone who's not dependent, and all it's going to do is affect the efficacy of the full agonist. Or you can have it in someone who is dependent, and that dropping of the effect of the full agonist will cause withdrawal symptoms. And then the mu partial agonists, we had buprenorphine, tramadol, and tipenadol. And just to put in these mixed kappa agonist mu antagonists, even though you don't need to memorize their names, we had pentazacine, nalbufin, and butorphanol. So any of these, because they all can decrease the activation of mu opioid full agonists, all of these can then cause withdrawal if a person is currently taking and dependent on a mu agonist. One of the things about buprenorphine is that it has an extraordinarily high binding affinity. So if you take that along with morphine, for example, the buprenorphine is going to bind way better than the morphine does. So you're going to basically kick most of the morphine off, and it's not really going to be able to bind and do anything. The other thing to remember is that mu agonist, mu partial agonist, it's an agonist effect if there's no full agonist around, and it's an antagonist effect if there is a full agonist around. So it's only going to have this withdrawal be able to cause withdrawal if you have a mu-full agonist in your system. If there's not a mu-full agonist there, then there's nothing to block. So to explain a little bit more about why buprenorphine has these special uses, we're going to look at why that partial agonism contributes to the different uses. So buprenorphine is used for analgesia in a very normal way. It's used alone, not in the presence of other opioids. And you take someone, they come in, they broke their leg, you give them buprenorphine, and it has an agonist-like effect. And they get their analgesia. And they're happy and you're happy. So it's just used as a normal mu analgesic. If you don't need to get a super strong effect, then you don't need to worry about it having that ceiling effect. That's just fine. It can also be used during assisted opioid withdrawal treatment. And withdrawal treatment is what's happening when someone is initially coming down off of an opioid. So I wanna kind of separate these and say this is just an analgesic activity. These two and three are happening. Withdrawal treatment is for physical dependence, to treat physical dependence-induced withdrawal. And then number three here is for addiction. 
And again, people can have physical dependence without being addicted. So we really want to think about those two things separately. If physical dependence is not the same as addiction, then we're not going to treat them the same way. So if someone comes in and they're physically dependent, so they've been taking morphine and they're up here with morphine doses, and now you could just discontinue the dose, they'd come down with the half-life of morphine, and pretty quickly they'd be in withdrawals. So our options there were to taper, was one of the options. But another option would be to give a drug that has a lower efficacy and substitute it for the morphine. And what that would look like would be coming in and giving them this buprenorphine, which is not going to activate as much as the morphine did. So now you've come down from an activation level here to an activation level here. So it's really an alternative to a taper in that it just helps you not drop down as quickly and hopefully avoid withdrawal symptoms. Maintenance treatment is what happens again after you are no longer dependent. And so what happens in maintenance treatment is you have a goal, is to keep that person from reusing an opioid of abuse. So maintenance treatment always starts after they're clean, after there's no more opioid in their system, they're not dependent, all you want to do is keep them from using again. So there's a couple different things that you have to think about. One is they're only going to use if they're going to get high from using. So if you can keep them from getting high if they use heroin or fentanyl or oxycodone, then they're not going to do it anymore because they're not going to get anything out of it. And so the fact that buprenorphine has this high affinity binding makes it really excellent because if you take buprenorphine daily, it binds all those mu receptors and now they're plugged up. And if you go and take heroin, it's not going to do much because it doesn't have a lot of receptors it can bind to to do anything. So you're walking around, you slip up, you take heroin, and it doesn't give you much of a high. And so it's a lot easier then to say, okay, well, that wasn't great. Your brain now starts to disassociate reward and pleasure from the drug. And it's like, well, it wasn't, it wasn't that great that time. Maybe it's easier to not do it again. So that's one of the reasons it's used in addiction treatment. And the second one is actually because it does have some new opioid activity. And a lot of people say, well, why would you give someone who's addicted to an opioid why would you want to give them anything that has any mu opioid activity? Because that's just giving them some of what they were already doing, even if it's at a much lower effect. And one of the problems with opioid addiction, in, and in fact with a lot of addictions, is it's simplistic to say, but you can kind of say it burns out the pleasure-reward pathways. And so those pleasure-reward pathways that before using opioids or, or drugs of abuse might have been pretty normal, Normal thing makes you normal amount of happy. And then after having these high dopamine surge, drugs of abuse, it takes more and more and more of a stimulus to get that pleasure or reward sensation. And so now if you stop taking those, you go back to a point that it's very difficult to feel pleasure from things. So things that would normally make you feel good, you know, having a great dinner, have chocolate ice cream, going to a movie, being with your friends, those things would normally give you pleasure, may not give you pleasure anymore. And no one wants to live like that. No one wants to feel numb. It's something that a lot of people report it really inhibits their ability to stay clean, is that they just feel awful without taking it. And so giving them this baseline opioid effect from this partial agonist actually kind of more brings them back to normal in that it keeps them feeling kind of okay so that they can move forward and keep clean. So you tend to have better compliance by giving a partial agonist than you would by giving someone an antagonist like naltrexone. So when we talked about the drug classes and mechanism of action of these drugs, when we talked about it for buprenorphine, we said it was a mu partial ag and that it was a kappa antag. So we had the mu partial agonist, kappa antagonist, and we classified that in our partial agonists. 
with drugs like butorphanol, nalbufen, or pentazacine, we said, well, those are kappa agonists, and they are mu antagonists. But in reality, they were very low efficacy mu partial agonists that really acted like antagonists. And we called those our mixed kappa ag mu antags. And that makes perfect sense. And you can understand what these drugs are going to do to mu receptors. And you can understand that these guys are going to activate kappa and block mu. When you look these up, most of the times when you look these up for drug class, you're going to see them referred to in this way, and it's going to make perfect sense. However, there are sources, and they can be really good sources, that will really mix this terminology up. And I've seen sources that call buprenorphine a mixed agent, and I've seen sources that call butorphanol a partial agonist. And technically, if you consider a mixed agent as anything that has agonism at one receptor and antagonism at another, then you could say, okay, agonist at mu, antagonist at kappa, maybe you could call that mixed, but it's completely opposite of what our standard mixed agents are. So if you call that mixed, you're really risking a huge amount of confusion. And similarly, with butorphanol, we're calling them mixed, but that mu was a bit of a partial agonist, super, super weak, but technically it was partial. And so I've seen those listed as partial agonists, when in reality, the mechanism of that drug is based on it being a kappa agonist. And so then that confuses that with drugs like buprenorphine, when clinically and pharmacologically, they really shouldn't be classed with buprenorphine at all. So I want to warn you that you may see this terminology somewhat mixed up, and I want you to know why we're calling buprenorphine and these agents partials, and why we're calling butorphanol and these agents mixed, and know the mechanism behind that, and know the results of that, know the ramifications of why they would act differently as drugs. So again, just reminding you guys of the bionic opioids. They are opioids that have CERT and or norepinephrine reuptake transporter inhibition. And if you talk to anyone who's not a PU graduate, they don't know what bionic opioids means. Bionic is something I completely made up, but there are 13 years of students ahead of you who use this terminology. So if your preceptor doesn't, that's fine. Just explain to them that that's what we've been calling these just so that we can remember them. So what benefits would you expect from having a CERT or NET inhibition? Well, what was going on with serotonin and norepinephrine in chronic pain? If you remember, we had the nociceptive nerve ending comes in. Here's the central spinal synapse. The secondary afferent goes up to the brain and you had this brainstem pain modulatory pathway come down and release serotonin and norepinephrine onto that spinal synapse. And so that was inhibiting pain transmission. And we talked about how with things like fibromyalgia, we had a decreased activity of that pathway and that increase in serotonin and norepinephrine could help normalize by decreasing the amount of pain traveling through. And what you'll find is that people with fibromyalgia generally don't respond that well to opioids, partly because they have fewer opioid receptors in their brains. But of opioids, they tend to respond better to these bionic opioids than others. And that's really because you're focusing on that SNRI activity. And that SNRI activity also seems to help with things like neuropathic pain. So the benefits are that it has more mechanisms of pain relief, and the disadvantages are that it's going to have the same types of side effects or risks that an SNRI would have, and namely we talked about serotonin syndrome. So I'm not making you memorize any of the numbers on here, but I do want you to see that the SNRI activity is clinically significant. So here we have tramadol, partial mu agonist, SNRI, 
and methadone. And I want to remind you about that because we talked about earlier that also being an SNRI, but we didn't hadn't really gotten to talking about that phenomenon in general. So I want to bring you back so that you remember that methadone was that full mu agonist and SNRI, and that that had something to do with why it does seem to be a better agent for some chronic pain. So if you look here, I just wanted you to get a just an idea. If we're looking at the IC50s for the inhibition of serotonin reuptake and for norepinephrine reuptake, and compare that to something like duloxetine that is an SNRI, then you're going to see that that duloxetine is a lot more potent at the CERT than is tramadol. So duloxetine is definitely a stronger SNRI, but these guys are still in the running for it. I mean, they still have a significant effect. And then lastly, um, talking about different drugs of abuse, we've talked about many of them already. And one of them is purple drink, and that is going to be promethazine plus coating cough syrup. And mix it with the Jolly Rancher for flavor and Sprite or Mountain Dew. Adding the promethazine gives you a kind of dissociation while the coating gives you the normal mu opioid effects that you would expect. So it has a little bit of a different high than just an opioid itself, but it does definitely have reward and addiction risk. And if you have not seen it, I greatly suggest you watch the Scissor PSA because it's really amazing. All right, so quiz question just to walk you through it. Who would buprenorphine be best given to? It's got our PR, so we know that's our partial. An opioid dependent, so they're, they're currently dependent, added currently taking opioids, so they have opioids in their body at that time, plus are dependent, and they've not yet begun a step down from a full agonist. So that means they've got this full agonist in their body, and if you decrease the activity of that opioid, then they're going to go into withdrawals. So that does not sound like a good option for buprenorphine because the partial agonist will also act as an antagonist in the presence of a full agonist and will decrease activity. So that's a bad idea. Buprenorphine for an opioid addict who is not currently taking opioids and is in recovery. So they don't have any opioids in their body at all, so there's nothing for the partial agonist to actually block. It can't reduce the signaling of anything if there's no opioids in the body. So that one would be okay. We use that exactly for that purpose, to keep people from taking more opioids of abuse and maintenance treatment. And then the last one, because apparently there's no choice B, the last one is, could you give it to someone who is a chronic opioid pain patient? So we know that they're probably physically dependent on it, who's taking opioids currently, and who has constipation. So maybe they're thinking that if the constipation's due to opioids, then if they could use a partial agonist, maybe it decreased their constipation or something. But again, you've got them currently taking opioids, so they're in their system, and they're chronic opioid pain patients, so they are almost certainly going to be tolerant and dependent. So again, you'd have just like an A, a situation where you have someone taking a full agonist, and if you added in buprenorphine, you'd be dropping the effect. So again, you'd have the likelihood of having this withdrawal effect, and that would again be a bad idea. So hopefully that helps understand why and when a partial agonist could cause a problem.